We are in a series right now on uh, stewardship. Uh, we do a series every fall, I think, every fall, on stewardship, where we try to help explore, help understand what it would mean to steward your time and your money and your talents, um, uh, and use them in ways that are, that are pleasing to God. And this time, this fall, we're, our series is, we're, we're talking about, I love God, but, and so we're talking about things that get in our way of that, things that get in our way of really just fully living into what God would have for us in, in, in terms of our stewardship to him. And so uh, my talk right uh, this morning is, I love God, but uh, I have my own dreams, I have my own hopes, I have, and, and a lot of times what this really ends up meaning is I have my own stuff that I want to buy. Um, and so this stuff gets in the way. This stuff distracts us from, from where we're heading. But I'm going to start uh, back in the, in the book of 1 Kings, um, thinking about Solomon. I was in an airplane uh, recently. I've been in lots of airplanes recently, which is a good thing. Um, I've had to travel for work. Um, and I was in an airplane recently, and I was like, I, I thought, I'm just going to read some of 1 Kings and read it in kind of a bigger, longer way. A lot of times when we read the scriptures, if you're like me, you kind of, you're get, you get in, you get out, right? You, it's short little bits, and you're, and you're focused on one thing, and you're trying to understand one thing. I thought, I want to I feel it a little differently. So I, I read 1 Kings um, in this kind of longer, leisurely way. And it's interesting when you do it that way, that's when you start to see like this overarching storyline that's going on. So in 1 Kings, we're learning about this guy named Solomon. Uh, in the first half of 1 Kings, we're learning about this guy named Solomon. Solomon is uh, the son of a king named David. Um, and David was a great king. He was a, he was a man that God just loved so much. We hear over and over, he was a man after God's own heart, right? So, so David was a great king. He did some wrong things, but he just kept returning back to God. And so God, that's what God was saying. He's a man after my own heart. He, he keeps returning to me. He has a son. His son is Solomon. His son, we think his son was about 15 years old when he took over the kingdom, when he took over being king. Uh, and so one night, God comes to Solomon in a, in a dream, and God says to Solomon, ask anything you want. Anything you want, it's yours. And, and uh, this, is, this is the scripture that's on the wall right now. Solomon says, but I'm only a little child, and I don't know how to carry out my duties. Isn't that just great already? Don't you feel like you're already like, aww? Right? It's so sad and, and poignant. He says, I'm just a little kid. I have no idea what I'm doing. And you've asked me to rule this whole huge, huge country full of people, right? Full of very passionate, very, very, uh, very uh, national people. So I'm only a little child and I don't know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count in number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? This is so amazing. This 15-year-old kid, God comes to him and says, anything you want, right? And he doesn't say Xbox, right? <laughs> what do you want for Christmas? A anything. I want to be wise. What? 15-year-old, right? So God even, God even after that incident in the next verse is like, whoa, that's a surprise. I did not think you were going to ask for wisdom. I thought you were going to ask for money and power. Since you didn't ask for those things and you asked for wisdom, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you more than anyone else has ever had. I'm going to make you the wisest person who's ever lived because you asked for wisdom. And then he says, and this is cool if you're 15, and then he says, and by the way, since you didn't ask for money, I'm going to give that to you too. So you're going to have more money than anybody, you're going to have more stuff than anybody, you're going to have more power than anybody, and more wisdom than anybody. So we, set, we get set up that this is going to be good, this story is going to be interesting, this little kid is going to be smart and wealthy and powerful, and we're going to see what he does. So he starts off in a really good way. As you, start, if you, as you continue to read in Kings, he starts off in this good way. He starts building the temple. This is a mission that his dad wanted done. His dad wanted to build a temple for God. Up until now, God's been living in a tent, like a, like a pup tent out in the backyard, because Israel's been wandering, right? They had been going through the desert and, and wandering, and so they made a tabernacle for him, which was more of a temporary temple, and they could move it as they went. And they still had this thing, even though they were in Jerusalem and more settled. So David, his father, really wanted to build a temple, um, but... 
For one reason or another, God's like, eh, it's not your job. It's going to come after you. Now Solomon is after him, and Solomon says, okay, I know my mission. I'm supposed to build a temple. So he's like, I'm going to build this temple, and I'm going to build it great. So he gets on the internet, and he's like, who has the best trees in the whole world? And he researches this, and he's really interested in these trees, right? And so he starts to buy um, juniper trees and cedar trees from Lebanon. They must have had the best cedar trees that there were. Cedar Falls obviously wasn't in the running yet. It was too hard to ship. Um, but, 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 but he gets his cedar trees from Lebanon. So he makes this deal with the king, and, they say, and he says, just start cutting them down and start shipping them to me. All the cedar trees you can do, just start shipping them to me. In fact, I'll send you people over there who will help you gather them and bring, and bring them to us. So he starts getting these trees, right? And then, we, and then we see he also wants to find the best stone. So he finds this, these great stone cutters and he finds this great quarry. And these guys start cutting this amazing, massive amounts of stone. He finds the best, the best bronze worker that there is. And he starts having him make these bronze things, these very elaborate things. He finds gold workers who can make gold. He finds ivory workers who can make ivory things, right? Do you see the, what's happening? He's, he's researching and he's figuring out the best of the best. That's all I want for this temple. So he builds this temple. And as you're reading along, you're like, wow, this is pretty elaborate. In fact, this is when you start to feel a little bit of a cringe of, Is this too elaborate? Like, is God happy about this? Probably he is, right? Probably he is. It's a temple. It's his thing um, that that he's been waiting for. So he probably is good. But but the more it goes, the more you're like, I don't know about that. I don't know if he needed to cover everything inside the Holy of Holies with gold. It just feels like, ah, it's a little much. It's a little Vegas, if you know what I mean, right? So so you're getting this little cringe, but it's not a big deal yet. You're, You're like, okay, I can do this. Then... You get to the end of where the temple is done, and it's a great, huge, cool ceremony. And you get to this verse that says, and it took Solomon seven years to build the temple. And you're like, ah, that's about right. It's a big building. It's an old time. Next page. It took Solomon 13 years to build his own house. And that's when you're like, wait a second. Wait, 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 wait. It took him seven years to build the temple and 13 years to build his own house. Is that saying something? A lot of times in the scripture, if you have your radar on and you're seeing these kinds of numbers come by and they're comparisons. And that's when you're like, wait, maybe something's not right inside of Solomon, right? Maybe he's gone a little too far. He's gotten caught up in these trees and caught up in this stone and caught up in this bronze. And you keep reading and you're like, yeah, he's definitely got caught up. They just start describing how his house is so elaborate and amazing. And I want to read you this verse. This is in 1 Kings 10. This is where we get to his throne. I just want to remind you a throne is just a chair, right? This is his chair. This is what he's going to sit on when he rules people. Then the king made a great throne covered with ivory and overlaid with fine gold. So wait, you start with stone, you cover it with ivory, then you layer it with fine gold. The throne had six steps to his chair. There were six steps to his chair, and its back had rounded top. On both sides were armrests. Of course there were, because you have to do this. No. <laughs> right? Uh, on both sides there were armrests, and there was a lion beside, standing beside each of them. And I think somewhere else we hear that the lions were covered with gold too. And all of... Uh, Then there were six lions, one on each end of either step. No, 12 lions. 12 lions, one on either end of each step. Now, this is a chair that no one else has seen. In fact, the scripture says that next. Nothing like it had ever been made for any other kingdom. Wait, 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 wait. This, he just went over the top, right? He, the scripture even tells you, no one else has done this. There's been other kings, other rich people, other people who are rulers, And they didn't make a chair like that. And so you're starting to say, yeah, he's off the rails. Then the the next verses I just think are great. All of Solomon's goblets were gold, and the household articles in the palace were gold. And nothing was made of silver because silver was considered of little value in Solomon's days. Right? The internet got him. That's what happened here. Then we hear a few verses later, Solomon had accumulated chariots and horses. He had... 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horses. He just couldn't stop buying them. Like, what is the next one? Like, ooh, that's a cool chariot too. I need that one. How many chariots do you need? In fact, we hear later that he has a town to store the chariots. He had to have a town 
to store the chariots and the 12,000 horses. Something has gone wrong with Solomon. Turn the page. Next page. Solomon has 700 wives and 300 concubines. He collects wives. He gets on the internet again, and he's like, who has the coolest wives? And, 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 the, and, the, and the, I'm not just, that was funny too, but I'm not just, he like collects them. Because the scripture tells us that he gets wives from every kingdom. He's spreading it out. It's a collection. It is a collection. And the concubines, it tells us, are concubines because they're not of royal enough birth to be wives. But he's like, well, they're not royal enough, but I still should have some. 300, right? Something's gone wrong. And this is when finally God steps in and God says, no, 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 no. You're not like your father, David. You are not following in the ways of God. The Bible says these these wives have led him into worshiping other gods. I would postulate he was already worshiping other gods. But the Bible says his wives led him to worshiping these other gods, and that's when God said, no, no, we're done. You are no longer going to rule for a long time. Your kingdom is going to be cut short. What's going on? What's going on when you read these 11 verses and you start to feel this sense? What's going on? Well, what's going on is something that we all have this thing inside of us where we, where we just get on a rail, we get on a treadmill, we get into a mode and we just keep going down that direction because it isn't about the chariots. It isn't about the gold leaf. It's about something else. There's something else inside of us that, uh, that, that gets us to go on these, on these treadmills, on these rails. I learned this very interesting phrase this, this year that has been really helpful to me in thinking about this. The phrase is, it's an infinite game. It's an infinite game. They're all infinite games. I was talking to a friend of mine, and he gets out his phone. We were talking about this kind of an issue where you just start something. You know, you start buying headphones, and you can't stop buying headphones. Well, how many do you need, Kurt? That was just to me. Uh, a lot, it turns out. I need a lot, Right? But we were talking about these kinds of things, and he gets out his phone, and he says, look at this. I have this game on my phone, and it's an investing game. You, can, you start off with some amount of money, but then you have to invest that money in, st- in these fake stocks. It's all, a, it's all a fake thing. And then you get your uh, rewards back, and you reinvest them. He says, check out my balance. And it was some number above trillions, you know, so he had like four quadrillion dollars. <laughs> and he's like, this is when I realized it's an infinite game. It's an infinite game. It's never going to stop. I could keep getting more money, and I would just still want to have more money. And he was, it was so interesting because it's both like the game itself is infinite, but there's something in us. Why did he play it to four quadrillion dollars? Why? Why? Because that's exactly how we work. We are, we, we are, we are susceptible to these infinite games. Why? So, next level down, why? Why? Why are we susceptible to infinite games? That's a hard question. That's a hard question, and I do not have a great answer for you. But what I can tell you, I can point you at three things. There are three places I can point you to look at when you become involved in an infinite game. When you start saying, what in the world do I need more of that for? Don't I have enough, like, uh, longer burger baskets? Don't I have enough shoes? Don't I have enough headphones, bicycles? Oh, my, I can't stop. I can point you at three things to look at when you're involved like that. Then one, first one, distraction. Distraction. We all, this turns out to be a super powerful force. The more I read about it, the more I'm like, wow, this is really deep in us. We need to distract ourselves from ourselves. This guy I love to read, uh, Pascal, he said this. Uh, He said, I think that the sole cause of a man's unhappiness is. Now this is amazing. When this guy says this, you perk up your ears. 
Pascal was in the 1600s. He was a philosopher, incredibly smart guy. His, his writing is amazing. And he gets, I get to this thing, uh, the sole cause of a man's unhappiness is. What do you think? What do you think his answer is going to, what do you think the next thing he's going to say is? This incredibly smart guy. The sole cause of a man's unhappiness is, next slide, that he cannot stay alone in his room. What? That he, can, that he does not know how to stay alone in his room. The more, seriously, the more you think about that, the deeper it's going to get. If you are, you, you, many of you have already like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But if you think about this, the more you think about this, the deeper it's going to get. We have got to, there's something inside of us that makes us have to distract ourselves from ourselves. Pascal goes on and talks a lot about this. He talks about how we, have, we know we're going to die. We know that's out there. And we just don't want to face it. We don't want to think about it. And how can you stop yourself from thinking about it? Well, you can distract yourself. Or we know that we have these things in us that aren't good, that we've done things that aren't good, that we want things that aren't good. And we don't want to think about those. Well, how do you stop yourself from thinking about it? Distraction. Distraction. So one of Pascal's theories is all of this stuff that we get involved in, including, he, he would say, including the arguments that you have with each other, the fights that you have, the uncomfortable things that you wish would just go away. Pascal's like, actually, do you wish those would go away? Because if they would go away, what would you be left with? You. You'd be left with you. And you can't handle it. So you distract yourself. You distract yourself with wars. You distract yourself with fights. You distract yourself with buying things. You distract yourself with internet research about cedar trees. In fact, this is an interesting uh, tying it back to Solomon. One of the things that Pascal said, he said, let's just imagine a king. A king should be the happiest person there is. A king should just be satisfied. A king should be able to sit on that six-step throne with his arms on his, on his chair and just like, I am really great. And my life is great too. But Pascal says, think about it. It's not how it works. Let us leave a king alone to reflect on himself, quite at leisure, without any gratification of his senses, without any care in his mind, without society, and we'll see that that king, without a diversion, is a man full of wretchedness. And that's why, he said, they always have people surrounding them, trying to distract them at every moment. They never have any time. So, one of the reasons, one of the reasons that you continue to be on these treadmills, continue to have these hopes and dreams, these things that you're wanting, these things that you're chasing, is because you're distracting yourself. You're distracting yourself from thinking about yourself. My wife and I, just to tell you how we use this all the time, all the time, my wife and I will say, I know I'm looking for a distraction. I just know I'm looking for a distraction. When Kara looks over, Kara's my wife, when Kara looks over and I was shopping for shoes again last night, like, yeah, I know, I know. Okay, number one is distraction. Number two, another reason, another reason that you're doing these things is because you have a lack of vision. You have a lack of vision. You're, and what I mean by that is you're not seeing far enough. You're not seeing big enough. Here's, a verse, here's some verses from John, uh, chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night. This is, a, this is a critical detail. He came to Jesus at night. And he said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you're doing if God were not with him. And Jesus said, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. This guy, this ruling guy, comes to Jesus at night. He comes to Jesus in a state of darkness. He comes to Jesus in a place where he can't see, right? And Jesus says to him, you can only see the kingdom of God if you've been born again. You can only see the kingdom of God if you have a birth from heaven, is another way that, that that's been translated. And so this is this issue where we have lack of vision. We have lack of foresight. We have lack of seeing what we're supposed to see. You can only see the kingdom of God if you've been born from above. What are we talking about, this kingdom of God? This, this is a bigger picture thing that we need to see. 
So here's this idea that comes from philosophers too. If your whole vision is the earth, and, 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 and that's as far as it goes. We have a, we have a slide here of, of the earth. If that's it, if that's it, if that's all there is, is earth, and there is nothing beyond it. Or if, like many people in this room, you have a vision that there is a heaven, but it really doesn't enter into your day very often. It really doesn't enter into your vision very often. For the most part, you act as if your vision is the same as other people where it's just earth, right? If that's your, if that's your scope, if that's your scale, then let me just tell you something. Those shoes are really important. Those dreams are really important. Those things that you want are really important. You should do them. You should go for it. You should follow the culture who says, you know, you only live once. Do it. Because that's, if that's all you have, then make it work. Right? Make it happen. The same guy, Pascal, said, it affects our whole life. It affects our whole life to know whether our soul is mortal or immortal. He's saying the same thing. It, it, it affects everything about you, to, to, uh, whether or not you're looking just at tomorrow, just at next week, just at, just at your life, or whether your vision is bigger than that, right? If your vision is this, if your vision is earth is tiny, all this stuff is small, this is a wisp, this is a mist, this is a breath, this is a flower that's gonna die. If that's your vision, which is all things the Bible tells you, if that's your vision, then these things are small. Then these dreams are tiny. Then, then, then there's a bigger thing that, you sh that you're looking at. Now, I'm going to just admit to you, which I've done several times already this morning, it's hard. That's hard to keep in front of you, right? Because you do have to eat tomorrow. You do have to wear shoes tomorrow. You do have to put some things in a longer burger basket tomorrow. I don't know if you really do, but remotes really go well, right? Ah. Uh, so you do, you do buy things. You do have to look at things. It's a, but it's this matter of vision. If your vision is big enough, you can keep those things in a better perspective. So number two reason that you're, that you're on these um, sort of treadmills is because you just don't have a big enough vision. And number three, uh, this one's going to sound pretty trite, but it's just habits. Here's, a, here's a something that's... that's easy to say and uh, again fairly deep but whatever you do today makes it more likely you're going to do that tomorrow that's just true about us whatever you do today whatever you do today it makes it more likely you're going to do that tomorrow now it doesn't make it inevitable obviously today's a Sunday and tomorrow's a Monday there's going to be some differences there but that's just how we work when we do things it just makes it more likely we're going to do them again so in the, other, in the next few verses of that Nicodemus that we were just looking at, Jesus later says to Nicodemus, Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and spirit. And then he says this amazing thing, flesh gives birth to flesh and spirit gives birth to spirit. Flesh begets flesh. That's how I learned it begets it's a, it just seems like a cleaner way to say than saying gives birth to but that's what it means if you don't know the word flesh gives birth to flesh spirit gives birth to spirit flesh begets flesh flesh begets flesh flesh begets flesh this is how it works this is how it works the more you shop for shoes the more you shop for shoes the more you buy trees the more you buy trees right the more you think about bikes the more you think about bikes this is how we work this is how our minds work Now, how, how, do you, how do you get off? How do you get off these kind of treadmills? Well, the first way, the first way is in, found again in that Nicodemus verse. Flesh, or, uh, no one can see unless they're born again, unless they're born of the Spirit. There is definitely something that in order to get from line one, flesh begets flesh, to spirit begets spirit, in order to get from one of those sentences to the other, you need some help. You totally need some help. There's no way you can go from one of those to the other one of those on your own. God has got to come in. That first spirit is a capital S. God has got to come in with his spirit and help you get on a different track. Help you get on a different treadmill. 
help you get in a different mindset. Spirit can beget spirit. But one thing it requires is the spirit of God being involved in that. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born from above. Born with a spirit with a capital S of God. So that's one thing. But I'm just going to tell you, even with spirit, you cannot move from one of those to the other and stay on spirit beget spirit without some internal work of your own. Without some internal kind of thing going on. You have got to, you have got to participate in the spirit begets spirit kind of work. You have got to realize and identify those times when you are on a flesh begets flesh treadmill. When your habits, when your thoughts, when your dreams have all become small, have all become habitual. You have got to help. You have got to identify and, and say, I am going to get off this treadmill. I am, going to st- I am going to look at something else. I am going to do something else. I am going to put down the internet and pick up a book. I am going to put down part of the internet, Facebook, and pick up another part of the uh, internet of people talking about spiritual things. I'm not, I don't want to say the internet's all bad. I go to the internet all the time for learning about spiritual things. But you have got to participate in this. So I just want to, I just want to close by saying uh, there is, in the Bible, all kinds of places where it just gives you a picture. Instead of a prescription, it gives you a picture of what it looks like to live in a spirit begets spirit kind of way. One of these is in Psalm 37. Psalm, Psalm 37. And what I, I'm, this is going to be on the screen right now. And I just want you to listen to it with these different kind of ears or see it with these different kind of eyes. I want you to compare what's in here to how you generally live. I want you to see how this is different from a a, a driving, buying, dreaming kind of way. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. How different does that sound than the culture that we live in today? How different does that sound than the way that we all often go about our own days? The next slide just highlights the verbs. I just want you to think about the verbs. This is what you're asked to do in those sentences. Trust, do good, dwell, befriend, delight, commit, be still, wait, fret not. (laughs) Those Those verbs, those verbs are the kinds of verbs that are in flesh begets flesh. I mean, spirit begets spirit kinds of way. Spirit begets spirit comes out of trust, do good, dwell, befriend, delight, commit, be still, wait, fret not. And then what that same psalm says about God, talks about God in these long-term ways. He will give you the desires of your heart. He will bring forth out of you your justice. He will bring forth out of you your, your, your goodness. Right? These are long things. And by the way, I just want to touch one quick thing on the give you the desires of your heart. It's not saying he's going to give you what you want. It's saying he's going to give you what you want. He's going to, he's going to make what you want. He's going to form in your heart those desires, desires for the right things. He's going to spirit begets spirit your heart. So I'm going to close with finally, brothers. This is Philippians 4, 8, my wife's favorite verse. Finally, brothers and sisters... Whatever is right, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Think about those things. This is a verse that I highly encourage you to memorize. And then you can say it to yourself. When you're in a flesh begets flesh kind of mode and you're shopping for cedar trees online, 
And you can say to yourself, wait, 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 wait. Whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely and admirable, if anything is praiseworthy, think about these things. Flesh begets flesh, and spirit begets spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you for more pictures, more stories, more, more visualizations of what it looks like to live in your kingdom. What it looks like to have been given an advantage like Solomon did, but still fall off the rails, still get obsessed with the things of this earth, still lose his perspective about who you are and where you are and what the kingdom is. I pray for all of us in this room that despite the fact that we are absolutely going to fall into a flesh begets flesh way, that we can see it, that we can understand. We're t- I'm trying to distract myself. I'm, 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 I'm going on my habits again. That we can see it and identify it and say, no, I need a new, a bigger vision. I need a spirit begets spirit kind of life. Now, as we head into communion where we have an opportunity to ingest you, to, to be with you, to commune with you, and to take your power into our lives. I pray that that will empower and embolden us to live that way. Amen. Amen.